An essential part of the story of the Gilded Age is the role of labor organizations and conflict between employers and employees. The concept of workers coming together to form a union to bargain collectively with management experienced a long struggle to even exist in American history. Early combinations of workers during the colonial and antebellum periods were viewed with suspicion and considered dangerous, perhaps even treasonous. Consolidation of labor received its first breath of legal recognition in 1842 when the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court ruled in the case Commonwealth v. Hunt that labor combinations were indeed legal as long as they were organized for a legal purpose and used legal means to achieve their goals. Thereafter, American labor unions slowly grew and slowly gained recognition, but still struggled for broad recognition and acceptance. It is not surprising that as the size and scale of industry grew in the United States during the Gilded Age, so too did membership in labor unions. Conflict between labor and management was inevitable and occurred extensively during the Gilded Age. Most early unions in the United States were local combinations and pulled together workers with a specific industry. These early attempts at unionization were often short-lived and attained only modest concessions from a local factory owner or industry leader. Some of the earliest combinations of workers that were more national were comprised of railroad workers. The brotherhood organizations that were formed comprising railroad workers proved that a union could be successful if it was national and did not have to restrict itself to just a small locality or single state. The Knights of Labor was one of the first broadly conceived national unions that enjoyed success during the Gilded Age. The Knights were founded after the Civil War and reached its peak membership during the 1880s. The Knights of Labor were unique in that the union attempted to represent all workers regardless if they were skilled or unskilled. The type of industry a member worked in also did not matter and also their age and gender. It is easy to see why the Knights of Labor originally had such broad appeal, but their lack of concentration in one industry or towards one type of workers also revealed their inherent weakness. Although peaking in the 1880s, the Knights quickly saw a dramatic decline in membership as workers left to join more specialized unions that better represented their skills or field of work. Workers did not give up on the idea of a national union, but they did realize they needed something better organized to deliver a concerted effort towards collective bargaining. Many former members of the Knights found the answer in the AFL, or American Federation of Labor. The AFL was founded in Columbus, Ohio in 1886 by several members of specialized craft unions. Because the founders were specialized or skilled laborers, the AFL, from its inception, was focused on representing skilled workers to management, leaving unskilled workers out of their organization. The AFL took a very pure and simple approach to unionism. The union would focus primarily on wages, hours, and conditions, often known as the big three of labor. More radical unionists would grow frustrated by its limited goals, but that was the point from the very beginning with the AFL to set reasonable, achievable goals that could improve the state of its member workers and leave more radical visions of revolution to others. The AFL maintained its measured mission and vision from its long-serving president, Samuel Gompers. Gompers was born to an impoverished Jewish family in the East End of London in 1850. He was granted very minimal education and was apprenticed to a cigar manufacturer at a young age in order to make money for his struggling family. Seeking better opportunities, Gomper's family emigrated to the United States in 1863 and settled into the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Gomper's gained work as a cigar manufacturer and joined the local craft union. Gomper's networked among the working class in Manhattan and came to see unions as the working man's best option to improve his lot in life. He was elected the president of the Cigar Makers International Union, Local 144, in 1875. Gompers helped found the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions in 1881, the organization that would later change its name to the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. Gompers was elected the first president of the AFL, and except for one year, 
would remain its president from 1886 until his death in 1924. The AFL focused on skilled workers and combined unions of skilled craftsmen into a large national union. The AFL quickly replaced the Knights of Labor as the most influential national union in the country. Gompers kept the AFL focused almost exclusively on the big three of labor, wages, hours, and conditions. He refused to believe class conflict was inevitable and revolutionary socialism as feasible. He believed a capitalist system could be profitable for all, and workers could earn a legitimate wage and provide for his family. Gompers strongly opposed increased immigration to the United States as well. He feared a surfeit of additional cheap laborers would undermine the gains achieved by unions in recent years. He particularly opposed Chinese immigration and strongly supported immigration quotas to keep out additional Asian immigrants. Gompers was also a strong supporter of World War I and worked to get unions to support the war effort, avoid strikes, and secure higher wages. Gompers' AFL came into regular and sometimes violent conflict with the other major union of the Gilded Age. Whereas the AFL concentrated on just skilled workers, the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, created a large national union that recruited the unskilled but hard-working men that performed some of the heaviest industry of the Gilded Age. The IWW, whose members were nicknamed Wobblies, was founded as an international union in Chicago in 1905. The union had strong ties to revolutionary socialism and anarchism much more than the AFL and recruited its members from such heavy industries as steel workers, railroad workers, dock workers, iron workers, and miners. This large industrial union focused on the rank and file, so to speak, rather than empowering union leaders to negotiate with employers and owners. The IWW did not seek to improve capitalism like the AFL. The IWW sought to replace it with some form of ideal socialism of which its members could never come to agreement regarding. The well-known founder of the IWW was Bill Haywood. Big Bill, as he became known, took an early interest in labor activities after working as a miner. While whittling a slingshot as a child, Haywood was blinded in one eye giving him an even more fearsome and intimidating presence later in life as a union leader. At the founding meeting of the IWW, Big Bill Haywood declared, quote, Fellow workers, this is the Continental Congress of the working class. We are here to confederate the workers of this country into a working class movement that shall have for its purpose the emancipation of the working class from the slave bondage of capitalism. The aims and objects of this organization shall be put to the working class in possession of the economic power. The means of life, in control of the machinery of production and distribution, without regard to capitalist masters." Unquote. Haywood was acquitted of murder in 1907, but he was jailed with dozens of other IWW members in 1918 due to his anti-war activities. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but in 1921, while out of prison appealing his conviction, he escaped to the Soviet Union. Haywood served as a labor advisor to Lenin's Bolshevik government, but grew lonely and depressed in the Soviet Union. He often spoke of his desire to return to the United States, but died of alcoholism in Moscow in 1928. Business leaders looked at the IWW with particular alarm due to their focus on so-called direct action, strikes, boycotts, and violence to achieve their ends. The IWW reached peak membership before World War I, but due to the Union's refusal to support the war, the Wobblies were viewed as unpatriotic. Internal divisions within the IWW's leadership, as well as the suppression of leftist groups during the first Red Scare, led to the first reduction of IWW influence. One of the other famous unions of the Gilded Age era were the Molly Maguires. Much of the history surrounding the Maguires is obscure and possibly the stuff of legends and rumors. The Molly Maguires were known as a workers association among Irish immigrants who worked predominantly in the coal fields of Pennsylvania. Although it is unclear, the Maguires were known for organizing violent activities including sabotage, riots, and assassinations in order to draw attention to the plight of Pennsylvania coal miners 
and to win concessions from mine owners. Twenty members of the Molly Maguires were convicted on charges of arson and murder and then executed in the 1870s. Much of the activities of the Maguires remains debated today, but even the rumors surrounding their organization indicates the secrecy, hostility, and conflict that existed between labor groups and business during the Gilded Age. In some part due to conflict between labor and business, the United States experienced two significant economic contractions during the Gilded Age. The first occurred in 1873, known as the Panic of 1873. The Panic of 1873 was sparked by rising inflation of prices, over-speculative investments in railroads, demonetizing silver in the United States, the impact of the Franco-Prussian War in Europe, property losses due to the great fires that occurred in Chicago and Boston, and the decline in bank reserves, particularly in New York. The Panic of 1873 was the greatest economic setback in United States history up to that point. Unemployment shot up to 14% by 1876, and many other workers were desperately underemployed. Overall, wages for the American worker dropped upwards of 55%. Thousands of businesses failed, defaulting on more than a billion dollars of debt. One in four laborers in New York were unemployed during the winter of 1873-1874. Railroad investors, who were particularly responsible for the contraction, saw devastating results in their industry. National construction of new rail lines dropped from 7,500 miles of track in 1872 to just 1,600 miles in 1875. Production in iron and steel alone dropped as much as 45%. The unrest and desperation engendered by the Panic of 1873 boiled over in the Tompkins Square Riot of 1874, 7,000 unemployed workers gathered in Thompson Square to protest the downturn. When mounted police rode into the crowd to disperse the protesters, several confrontations took place. Dozens were arrested. Many were injured. The riot seemed to symbolize the unrest threatening to explode during the Gilded Age, and not just in New York City. The relationship between workers and business owners did explode, with the outbreak of the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. The unrelenting bitterness of the Panic of 1873 put unprecedented strain on the American economy, and the downturn particularly affected the American worker. Railroad construction that was pursued in earnest after the Civil War became overextended and filled with too much debt in the Gilded Age. When significant banks in New York and those insuring the loans defaulted and failed, it sparked massive layoffs and wage reductions across the railroad industry. For the third time in a year, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad cut wages on its workers in 1877. Workers who refused to accept the reduction walked out on strike on July 14, 1877 in Martinsburg, West Virginia. All across the country, several rail lines came to a halt as strikers blocked lines, occupied rail cars, and clash with railroad owners and local authorities. Maryland and Baltimore witnessed some of the greatest violence as Maryland National Guard were dispatched by the governor to protect the railroads. Guard units were harassed by residents of Baltimore as they marched through the streets. Eventually a clash broke out when projectiles were thrown at the troops. Fearing for their lives, the troops opened fire on the crowd, killing 10 and injuring another 25 civilians. Rioters burned a portion of the railroad and continued to harass and injure the National Guard units until federal troops were called into the city. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania became the site of the worst violence of related strikes. Thomas Alexander Scott of the Pennsylvania Railroad, described as one of the first robber barons, suggested that the strikers should be given, quote, a rifle diet for a few days and see how they like that kind of bread, unquote. As in some other cities and towns, local law enforcement officers, such as sheriffs, deputies, and police, refused to fire on the strikers. Several Pennsylvania National Guard units were ordered into service by the governor. On July 21st, National Guard members bayoneted and fired on rock-throwing strikers, killing 20 people and wounding another 29. Rather than quell the uprising, these actions infuriated the strikers, 
who retaliated and forced the National Guard to take refuge in a railroad roundhouse. On July 22nd, the National Guard mounted an assault on the strikers, shooting their way out of the roundhouse and killing 20 more people on their way out of the city. After more than a month of rioting and bloodshed in Pittsburgh, President Rutherford B. Hayes sent in federal troops as in West Virginia and Maryland to end the strikes. Strikers set fires that raised 39 buildings and destroyed rolling stock, 104 locomotives, and 1,245 freight and passenger cars during the violence in Pittsburgh alone. The violence and damage in Pittsburgh was so extensive that damage estimates range from five to ten million dollars. Violence broke out on July 22, 1877 in Reading, Pennsylvania as well, when a rail car was set ablaze on a railroad siding. A crowd of over 2,000 people took the depot and burned two cabooses, seven freight cars, and the watch house. Rioters set fire to the bridge of the Skullkill River to block movement of the state militia. Rail travel was blocked, telegraph lines damaged, and debris halted passage both up and down the Skullkill River. Units of the Pennsylvania State Militia were brought in by train. Near nightfall, one unit was marched into the 7th Street Cut, a man-made ravine three blocks long with 20 or 30 foot walls, to free a train that had been stopped by rioters. The soldiers were bombarded from above with bricks, stones, and gunshots, and some of the soldiers fired rifle volleys into a crowd at the far end of the cut. Between 10 to 16 civilians died and dozens were injured in the Reading Railroad Massacre. The strike finally lost momentum when President Hayes sent federal troops from city to city to suppress the violence until, 45 days after it had started, the Great Railroad Strike was finally over. With public attention on workers' wages and conditions, the b and Railroad in 1880 founded an Employee Relief Association to provide death benefits and some health care. In 1884, it established a workers' pension plan. Other improvements were implemented later, but the Great Railroad Strike clearly exposed the bitter relationship between labor and management in the Gilded Age. Violence often erupted between disgruntled workers and powers of business in the state. One of the more notable examples occurred in 1886 in the Haymarket Square bombing in Chicago. Tens of thousands of German and Bohemian workers had emigrated to Chicago and called for a national strike demanding an eight-hour workday. Perhaps half a million workers went on strike across the country on May 1, 1886, showing support for the eight-hour day. The strike was peaceful until a group of strikers attacked picket line crossers at the McCormick Harvesting Machine Corporation in Chicago. Guards fired into the crowd, killing one protester and injuring several others. Those events would lead to the famous bombing in Haymarket Square in Chicago. Spurred by outrage over the shooting, a group of anarchists called for a rally in Haymarket Square the following day to advance the eight-hour day campaign and show support for the strikers. The first flyer calling for a rally in the Haymarket on May 4th is on the left, and the revised flyer for the rally is on the right. The words, quote, working men arm yourselves and appear in full force, unquote, were removed from the revised flyer in an effort to prevent any additional threat of violence. The anarchist rally began peacefully under a light rain on the evening of May 4th. August spies Albert Parsons and Samuel Felden spoke to a crowd estimated variously between 600 to 3,000 while standing in an open wagon adjacent to the square on De Plain Street in Chicago. At about 10.30 p.m., just as one speaker was finishing his speech, police arrived marching in formation towards the speaker's wagon and ordered the rally to disperse. A police inspector commanded the speaker to stop and the crowd to leave. A homemade bomb filled with dynamite and ignited by a fuse was thrown into the path of the advancing police. Its fuse briefly sputtered, and then the bomb exploded, instantly killing policeman Matthias J. Deegan while flying metal fragments and mortally wounding six other officers. An unknown person had thrown the dynamite bomb at the police as they acted to disperse the meeting, and the bomb blast and ensuing gunfire 
resulted in the deaths of seven police officers and at least four civilians. Dozens of others were wounded. The Chicago police assumed that an anarchist had thrown the bomb, but the challenge was actually proving the act. An investigation in Dragnet resulted in the arrest of several anarchist leaders, writers, and bomb makers. In the internationally publicized legal proceedings that followed, eight anarchists were convicted of conspiracy. The evidence was that one of the defendants had may have built the bomb, but none of those on trial had thrown it, and only two of the eight were at the hay market at the time. Chemists testified that the bombs found in a suspect's apartment, including this one shown here, resembled the chemical signature of shrapnel from the Haymarket bomb. Seven defendants were sentenced to death and one to a term of 15 years in prison. Illinois Governor Richard J. Oglesby commuted two of the sentences to terms of life in prison. Another committed suicide in jail before his scheduled execution. The other four were hanged on November 11, 1887. In 1893, Illinois Governor John Peter Altgeld pardoned the remaining defendants and criticized the proceedings of the trial. The lack of clarity surrounding the bombing and the trial exacerbated the relationship between labor and business during the Gilded Age. Business leaders assumed anarchism and violence was rife throughout the labor movement, and labor leaders assumed business and state officials were conspiring together to squelch the workers' movement. An additional violent labor conflict occurred a few years later during the Homestead Strike in 1892. The Homestead Strike would draw into the public eye one of the Gilded Age's most famous industrialists and bring him exactly the type of negative press that he sought to avoid. The strike would also serve as a pattern for many of the large strikes during the Gilded Age that if the strike descended into violence, generally state authorities would get involved and defend first the business interests. The Homestead strike was also particularly notable for its organization and efficient leadership among union leaders. Homestead Steel Works was one of the largest steel plants owned by industrialist Andrew Carnegie and part of the Carnegie Steel Corporation. Carnegie Steel had undergone rapid growth in recent years and larger machinery meant greater output without the necessity of hiring as many skilled workers. Additional unskilled workers were hired but were experiencing a drop in wages. The steel workers at Homestead were represented by the union, known as the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, often simply referred to as the AA. The AA had actually scored some significant victories for the steel workers in previous strikes, and they anticipated a strike in 1892 to be no different. While Andrew Carnegie publicly expressed his support for unions, Privately, he sought to break the power of the AA at Homestead, reorganize the contract with workers, and withdraw recognition of the AA. The man Carnegie placed in charge of his industrial operations in 1881 was Henry Clay Frick. Henry Clay Frick was an American industrialist, financier, and art patron. He founded the H.C. Frick & Company, Coke Manufacturing Company, was chairman of the Carnegie Steel Company, and played a major role in the formation of the giant U.S. Steel manufacturing concern. He also financed the construction of the Pennsylvania Railroad and Reading Company and had extensive real estate holdings in Pittsburgh and throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Having Carnegie's blessing, Frick was determined to break the back of the AA Union at Homestead. Frick allowed the collective bargaining agreement with the union to expire on June 29, 1892. Workers were locked out of the plant and a high fence was constructed around the plant with barbed wire on the top. Snipers with searchlights were placed at the four corners of the plant. The workers dubbed the fortifications Fort Frick. The AA lead strike began on July 1, 1892. Strikers set up a picket line around the fence and even manned rowboats along the Monongahela River to prevent scabs, that is strike breakers, replacement workers, from taking their jobs and entering the plant. Frick was determined to hire non-union men to work at Homestead to replace the striking union members. Frick placed ads for steel workers in newspapers far away as Boston, St. Louis, and even Europe. In an effort to secure the premises of the plant, 
Henry Clay Frick hired the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. The Pinkertons were the nation's largest private security firm and were useful to guard a plant from strikers so that replacement workers could enter the premises. 300 Pinkertons were assembled five miles down the Ohio River from the plant on barges on the night of July 5, 1892. They were given a Winchester rifle. Their plan was to have the Pinkerton guards move up the river and then move from their barges on the riverbank onto the grounds of the homestead plant and then secure the plant. After moving up the river to the plant, the Pinkertons attempted to land from their barges onto the grounds of the homestead plant at 4 o'clock in the morning on the morning of July 6, 1892. Striking workers and local townspeople gathered around the plant, tore down the tall fence surrounding the plant, and began shooting at the Pinkertons as they attempted to land from the river. The local workers and strikers thought the Pinkertons were replacement workers and were about to take their jobs. The Pinkertons became trapped aboard their barges, unable to escape and unable to move inland and seize the homestead plant. Civilians continued to fire sporadically at the barges. Strikers moved against the Pinkertons and began to assault them. Sticks, clubs, and pieces of steel were sent hurtling against the Pinkertons, who remained trapped on the shoreline on the barges. At 5 o'clock p.m., after nearly a full day of fighting, the Pinkertons surrendered to the strikers. They raised a white flag from the barges and were escorted through town, enduring the abuse of local townspeople, strikers, and their families. The strikers finally managed to seize the barges and burn them to the waterline as a final act of defiance. Several Pinkerton guards have been killed in the battle and dozens injured. Hundreds surrendered to the strikers. In order to prevent any more additional violence, the state militia was called in by the Pennsylvania governor and arrived on July 12, 1892. The militia had orders from the governor to prevent any more violence and to protect the plant. 4,000 soldiers, clearly siding with the company, commenced a 95-day occupation of the plant. Strike-breaking workers were brought in and resumed production at the plant. As the strike dragged on, Homestead dramatically captured people's attention again when a New York anarchist named Alexander Berkman endeavored to assassinate Henry Clay Frick during the course of the strike. Berkman had no connection to organized labor, the AA, steel workers, or Homestead, but he sought to achieve his anarchist goals by targeting a major industrial figure. Berkman shot Frick twice and in an ensuing scuffle stabbed Frick in the leg repeatedly. Frick was seriously wounded, but survived and was back to work within days. Berkman was convicted of attempted murder and was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Even though Berkman had nothing to do with the union or the strike, the assassination attempt soured the public on the AA and the Homestead strike, equating it with endless violence and anarchist goals. Public sympathy for the strike collapsed, and after weeks and months of being out of work, more and more steelworkers crossed the picket line and returned to work. In the end, approximately 2,500 workers lost their jobs, and those that remained suffered drastic wage reductions. With the strike over, the National Guard pulled out in October of 1892. The Homestead plant quickly returned to full production, and the collapse of the strike and the declining power of the Union was a prominent symbol in the Gilded Age of the failure of labor and the power of business in government. The United States experienced the second of its two severe economic setbacks of the Gilded Age beginning in 1893. The nation had barely recovered from the Panic of 1873 when the economic conditions became even worse during the Panic of 1893. The Panic of 1893 surpassed in severity even its predecessor, provoking a deep recession that led many to label the decade the Hungry Nineties. Like the Panic of 1873, the Panic of 1893 was prompted by a multitude of causes. Bad investments by banks and industrialists in South America and South Africa led to bankruptcies, corporate debt, and defaults to U.S. firms. Lack of confidence in the nation's money prompted runs on U.S. gold, further destabilizing the currency. Wheat prices collapsed in the early 1890s. Bordering on bankruptcy and default, the federal government took the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad into receivership, 
to manage its books better and prevent its collapse. The repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act led to the end of the unlimited coinage of free silver, driving up gold prices and driving down farm prices. Banks in the United States failed upon the news of a financial panic in London. Conditions became desperate during the panic. Unemployment rose to a startling 25% in Pennsylvania, 35% in New York, and 43% in Michigan. Stock prices collapsed. 15,000 businesses failed. Soup kitchens opened in major cities, and businessmen resorted to manual labor in exchange for food. Major U.S. cities saw significant increases in the rates of prostitution. Community gardens were formed in major cities to feed the hungry. Gold levels declined in the Treasury, forcing President Cleveland to borrow $65 million in gold from Wall Street banker J.P. Morgan and the Rothschild banking family in England. As a sign of the desperation of the unemployed during the Panic of 1893, the first protest march ever to Washington, D.C. was conducted in 1894. The march showcased the plight of the poor and struggling and hungry and represented a peaceful contrast to the violence that characterized many of the major strikes during the Gilded Age. The march was led by an Ohio businessman named Jacob Coxey. Coxey had enjoyed a career buying and selling scrap metal in Massillon, Ohio. He came to believe the plight of the American worker could be improved if the government would print more paper currency and hire the unemployed for public work projects such as building roads, canals, and dams. Rather than lobbying the established political parties, Coxey and his associates decided on direct action to force Congress to meet their demands. The march originated with 100 men in Massillon, Ohio on March 25, 1894, passing through Pittsburgh, Becks Run, and Homestead, Pennsylvania in April. Various groups from around the country gathered to join the march, and its number had grown to 500 with more on the way from further west when it reached Washington on April 30, 1894. Coxey and other leaders of the movement were arrested the next day for walking on the grass of the United States Capitol. Interest in the march and protests rapidly dwindled. Although it was ultimately unsuccessful, the march is notable as the first protest march on Washington, D.C. in U.S. history. One of the most pivotal strikes of the era occurred near the end of the Gilded Age. The Pullman strike would once again demonstrate the potential power in labor unions, but also their limits and frustrations during the Gilded Age. Once again, a large strike commenced around railroads, but had far-reaching implications beyond just one industry. George Pullman was born in New York and was raised as an engineer. His father had worked on widening the Erie Canal and had patented a lift with jack screws to pick up and move entire buildings so that the canal could be expanded. His son George improved the means and won contracts in the city of Chicago to pick up multiple story buildings so that a sewer system could be constructed beneath the structure of the buildings. Pullman profited well from the specialized trade, but next turned his attention to the construction of his famous Pullman sleeper rail cars. Pullman commenced the construction of luxurious rail cars upon which passengers could dine, relax, and spend the night. Pullman sleeper cars first gained notoriety when he provided the rail car used to transport the body of Abraham Lincoln back to Springfield, Illinois after his assassination. Throughout the Gilded Age, traveling in a Pullman sleeper meant traveling in luxury and usually overnight on a cross-country journey. This Pullman car was built in 1928 and was known as the Abenson. At different times, it reportedly carried Presidents Herbert Hoover, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry S. Truman, and Dwight D. Eisenhower. The interior of the Pullman sleepers were luxurious with ornate lighting, mahogany woods, and large cushioned seats that provided first-class comfort. First-class guests could enjoy a better experience than traveling coach, visit the dining car, patronize the bar, and use the bathroom facilities on board. Best of all, first-class guests could purchase their own private rooms in which to sleep comfortably as the train continued along. Loft beds were pulled down and prepared at night, then made up and stored away for travel during the day. 
Those providing the first-class experience were the famous Pullman Porters. The Pullman Porters were largely African-American men, many of whom were former slaves, who were employed by the Pullman Company to handle baggage, make beds, cook, clean, and serve guests on board the Pullman sleepers. Many of them only earned the tips bestowed on them by happy patrons. The Pullman Sleeper Company was the largest African-American employer in the country during the Gilded Age. The construction of the Pullman cars was a large operation that required a large workforce. Their production was centered near Chicago in the town named after its founder and owner, Pullman. Pullman was built in the 1880s by George Pullman as workers' housing for employees of his railroad car company, the Pullman Palace Car Company. The town of Pullman was constructed adjacent to the Pullman Corporation so that workers could live near the plant and even walk to work. A city hall was constructed, a grocery, churches, theaters, parks, a library, and George Pullman provided many of the local services needed by its residents. The distinctive row houses were comfortable by standards of the day and contained such amenities as indoor plumbing, gas, and sewers. Residents of Pullman were thus beholden to George Pullman on two accounts. They received their wages from the company and paid rent and utility fees to the town owned by Pullman as well. The town of Pullman gained international attention as a workers' town and perhaps a model that could be duplicated by other industrialists. Many workers felt that they could not earn a high enough wage from Pullman, though, to in turn pay their rent to Pullman. Independent newspapers, political meetings, and rallies were forbidden in the town. Residents could not vote regarding town matters. Some alleged Pullman employees living in the Pullman-owned town wrote the following verse, quote, We are born in a Pullman house, fed from the Pullman shops, taught in the Pullman school, catechized in the Pullman church, and when we die we shall go to Pullman hell, unquote. During the Panic of 1893, the Pullman Palace Car Company cut wages by 30% as demand for new passenger cars fell and the company's revenue dropped. A workman might make $9.07 in a two-week period, and the rent of $9 would be taken directly out of his paycheck, leaving him with just $0.07 cents to feed his family. A delegation of workers complained that wages had been cut, but not rents at their company housing or other costs in the company town. George Pullman refused to lower rents or go to arbitration. The Pullman workers went out on strike on May 11, 1894. The strike at Pullman was led by the labor leader and activist Eugene V. Debs. Debs was a native of Indiana and, although the son of a prosperous businessman, took an early interest in the collective bargaining power of labor organizations. For over 30 years, Debs would become the most prominent face in America of unionism and large strikes. Debs was a founder of the American Railway Union, the Industrial Workers of the World, and of several socialist parties in the United States. Debs would be imprisoned multiple times for violating court orders against labor organizations or opposing the draft during World War I. He would eventually run for president five times as the socialist candidate. Debs brought the power of the American Railway Union to Pullman to support the striking workers there, but the strike failed and the union failed to secure any concessions from management for the workers. To draw national support to the Pullman strike, Debs escalated the strike into a more national railroad strike in 1894. He called for all rail lines west of Detroit to shut down, stop rail traffic, and garner national support for the Pullman workers. All trains that pulled Pullman sleepers were to be shut down. Approximately 250,000 workers in 27 states joined the strike. The American Railway Union started the national strike with the blockade of the Grand Crossing in Chicago during the night of June 26, 1894. Striking railroad workers attacked trains that attempted to keep rail traffic moving and clashed with National Guard troops and local police when they were called in to protect the trains. Violent clashes with authorities started in Chicago, but then spread to other states. Roughly 30 strikers were killed in Chicago alone, with dozens injured. Perhaps another 40 strikers were killed in other states with more injured as well. As damage to company property continued to mount, 
the Illinois governor called in the National Guard who violently suppressed strikers and endeavored to protect the rail lines and cars. Failing to break the strike, President Grover Cleveland declared he had a constitutional responsibility to keep the trains moving in order to deliver the mail. He therefore ordered thousands of U.S. Marshals and upwards of 30,000 regular Army troops to guard the trains and rail yards and beat back striking protesters. A federal court ordered the striking workers to return to their duties and the leaders of the American Railway Union to cease agitating for any more disturbances. Debs in the American Railway Union failed to garner the support of other regional rail unions and Gompers AFL refused to support the strike as well. With the arrival of federal troops, the lack of support from the other unions and the collapse of public support, the Pullman strike failed and ended in July of 1894. Pullman workers returned to the plant and company housing. Later, the state of Illinois ordered the Pullman company to sell off the housing in the town. Pullman became simply another community on the south side of Chicago, with most of its residents still working for the Pullman company. Debs was convicted on charges of conspiracy and obstructing the delivery of U.S. mail. He was sentenced to six months in prison. Debs became a socialist while in prison and wrote extensively for the future necessity of socialism in the United States. Large labor protests and clashes between unions and business not only occurred amidst large industrial centers in the East, but also among miners in the West. During the Gilded Age, Cripple Creek, Colorado was the largest town in the gold mining district 20 miles from Colorado Springs on the southwest side of Pikes Peak. Surface gold was discovered in the area in 1891, and within three years, more than 150 mines were operating there. When the mine owners endeavored to increase the workday from 8 hours to 10 hours without raising the daily $3 wage, the union of mine workers struck. The tension, conflict, and violence between owners and strikers continued for the next several weeks. The mine owners refused to give in to the strikers' demands and created a private security force out of local deputies in an effort to hire strike-breaking scabs back into the mines. The governor of Colorado, however, opposed the move of the mine owners and was sympathetic to the cause of the strikers. The governor called up the Colorado National Guard, which moved into Cripple Creek. A tense standoff commenced with the hired force of the owners, but they were eventually forced to give in to the power of the state. The Cripple Creek strike was a major victory for the miners' union. The Western Federation of Miners used the success of the strike to organize almost every worker in the Cripple Creek region, including waitresses, laundry workers, bartenders, and newsboys into 54 local unions. The Western Federation of Miners flourished in the Cripple Creek area for almost a decade, even helping to elect most county officials, including a new sheriff. The significance of the Cripple Creek strike was that for the first and only time during the Gilded Age, state authorities were called in to not protect business owners and their property, but rather striking workers themselves. The Colorado governor was not re-elected and a significant backlash occurred after the strike, but the use of state powers on behalf of workers was unprecedented. Despite the victory of the miners union at Cripple Creek, Colorado remained the scene of a multitude of strikes, labor unrest, and violent clashes into the 20th century. The union might have won at Cripple Creek in 1894, but in the coming years, under new state leadership, Colorado mine owners were able to call upon the power of the state to defend their interests and break the back of strikers. Colorado witnessed some of the greatest labor violence and strikes of the late Gilded Age, so significant and frequent that they became known as the Colorado Labor Wars. In 1894, in an effort to conciliate organized labor after the Pullman strike, President Grover Cleveland and the Congress designated Labor Day as a federal holiday in contrast with the more radical May the 1st. Legislation for the holiday was pushed through Congress six days after the Pullman strike ended, and the President quickly signed it. Labor Day remains a significant holiday in the United States to celebrate hardworking Americans and their role in building the modern United States.